Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's historic celebration of the late and great General Thomas S. Mormon, Jr. My name is Steve Jakes, Executive Director of the National Security Space Association. And on behalf of our members, we are truly honored to host this event for you. And thank you, Barbara Mormon and family, for giving us such a distinct opportunity. Folks, today you'll be hearing from some three dozen leaders, past, present, and likely the future. At first, you'll hear live tributes for two, with two space leaders, General D.T. Thompson, the Vice Chief of the U.S. Space Force, and then General John Hyten, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. After these two live tributes, we'll then turn on the video of recorded tributes, the grand finale coming from General J. Raymond, the Space Force's first Chief of Space Operations, and our previous Secretary of the Air Force, the Honorable Barbara Barrett. Believe me, you will want to stay until the finish. From these testimonials, you'll be hearing about General Mormon's legacy in space, who he was a, as a leader, who he was as a human being. You will hear this common theme, national treasure, icon, great and lasting legacy for this country, sense of honor and integrity, quickest study I've ever known, great storyteller, epitome of an officer and a gentleman, who knew he spent the first 10 years in the Air Force as an intelligence officer, where he spent nearly a quarter of his entire Air Force career in the National Reconnaissance Office? He taught and mentored multiple generations of space officers and industry leaders. He raised military space from infancy and adolescence to adulthood. The capabilities of the Air Force in space rest on his shoulders. Visionary and master of space, but more importantly, master of being a good person and a great man. He was the space visionary who laid the foundation path for we, that we embarked upon as junior officers. It is this foundation we are excited to see forming the new future. And folks, an event like this just simply would not be possible without the help of a lot of people. The speakers on this program, the senior advisors and friends who helped form the Mormon story. To NSSA's own Andrew Contillo, the Cecil B. DeMille of the film, aided by our friends and newest NSSA member company, Zoic Labs, an advanced data visualization company based in Los Angeles, who expertly polished Andrew's work to be the beautiful production it is today. To you all, we sincerely thank you. In closing, we offer following considerations. Without General Mormon, we would not have the Space Force and a reconstituted U.S. Space Command today. General Mormon is arguably the father of the United States Space Force. And finally, it's a blessing that General Mormon was still with us when we all witnessed the Space Force being established into law on December 20th, 2019. And so friends, without further ado, I'm honored to introduce the country's first Vice Chief of Space Operations, General David D.T. Thompson, a true and seasoned space officer in his own right, Air Force Academy grad, degree in astronautical engineering, an esteemed Olmsted scholar joining the ranks of the likes of luminaries Bud McFarlane, Generals John Abizade and Lee Butler. Assignments at the Advanced Millsotcom Program Office in Los Angeles, years in launch at the command, later as commander at Vandenberg Air Force Base. After that, Cape Canaveral, he commanded Buckley. He is the ultimate space officer, ascending to the top of the Air Force Space Command, then serving as vice commander under Generals Hyten and then General Raymond. And now as our nation's, did I say, first vice chief of space operations, ladies and gentlemen, I give you General D.T. Thompson. Thank you, Steve, and thanks to the National Security Space Association for hosting this special tribute today. Sir Isaac Newton, discoverer of the universal law of gravitation that defines motion of all objects in space, once wrote to a friend, if I have seen further than others, it's because I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And as Steve said, I'm General D.T. Thompson. I'm the Vice Chief of Space Operations for the United States Space Force. And we're here today, this afternoon to honor a giant of a man, General Thomas S. Mormon, Jr. 
the son of a visionary airman. General Mormon was born in Washington, D.C. and commissioned to ROTC at Dartmouth College in 1962. He joined the U.S. Air Force as an intelligence officer, but with the dawn of the space age, quickly became an expert advocate and visionary in the use of space for national security purposes. Throughout a long and distinguished career, General Mormon played key roles in the development, fielding, and operation of Air Force surveillance, communication, navigation, and weather satellite systems, space launch vehicles, anti-satellite weapons, ground-based missile warning and surveillance, space surveillance radars, and space command and control centers. General Warman held multiple command and senior leadership positions in space and homeland defense organizations, including the National Reconnaissance Office, the first space wing, serving as director of space operations for the North American Aerospace Defense Command and serving in Air Force Space Command, including duty as the fifth commander of that groundbreaking organization. Significantly, General Mormon was also selected and served as the 26th Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, the first with space experience to do so, and he began that duty in 1994. General Mormon retired from that position in 1997 after 35 years of distinguished service. Just as importantly, General Mormon was instrumental in finding, developing, and mentoring space leaders who would follow him and take the Air Force and military space to new levels of capability and criticality. You will help personal reflections today for many of those leaders and many of the stories of how instrumental, uh, instrumental he was in developing military space capabilities for the nation. It was that personal mission, that personal touch, and that personal connection to superiors, subordinates, and peers alike that truly set General Mormon apart. This was a personal mission, I might add, that extended well beyond his retirement and to the last days of his service to the nation and included a young general officer named D.T. Thompson. For Barbara, John, Thomas III, and the entire Mormon family, we join you in mourning the loss of an irreplaceable husband and father and soulmate at the same time, we celebrate the life and legacy of a great American airman, one of the first guardians of the high frontier and a true giant in every sense of the word. Just as Mitchell and Arnold are written into the history of the United States Air Force, people like Shriver and General Tom Mormon will be written into the history of the United States Space Force. It's now my privilege to introduce another product of General Mormon's mentorship and a giant of Air, Air Force and national security space in his own right, General John E. Hyten. General Hyten graduated from Harvard University and was commissioned into the US Air Force in 1981. Over the following 40 years, he has had multiple assignments in space operations, space engineering and acquisition, and on multiple space staffs. General Hyten is commanded at the squadron group, wing and major command levels, and in 2006 deployed to Southwest Asia as the Director of Space Forces for Operations Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. He most recently served as a commander of US Strategic Command, one of the DOD's 11 combatant commands, and is currently serving as the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the second highest ranking military officer in the Armed Forces of the United States. General Hyten. So thanks very much, DT. Uh... I'm, as you can see, I'm, I'm joined by my wife, Laura. She wanted, I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to, for her to say hi to Barbara. Say hi to Barbara. Barbara, hi. Uh, but, uh, and I have uh, prepared some remarks today. DTI, I appreciate the introduction. I really appreciate Steve Jakes and uh, the National Security Space Association allow us the opportunity to do this. Uh, I have prepared remarks, but I, I really hope just to sit here for a few minutes and, and talk and, and, tell some stories about a very special person, but I wrote it down, I kept it in front of me because uh, it's possible when I talk about General Mormon, I'll get a little bit emotional. And if I look down and read, it's because I'm just trying to catch myself a little bit to make sure I, uh, I can hold it together because uh, General Mormon is one of the most special people I've ever met in my life. Um, I really miss him. I miss him all the time. I really do. Uh, I've, I've known him and got to work with him for 30 years. And the amazing part about the, the video you're gonna see in a little while is that uh, of the people that you see come across, I'll be one of the short timers. 
Uh, but General Mormon, he, he led me, he mentored me, he set the example, he taught me, uh, and oh, by the way, he, he chastised me and corrected me in, in a way that anybody that's ever worked for him knows was a, a very clever and special way. He could, he could say something with, with humor, uh, with grace, uh, that would make you uh, know that you screwed up and know that you needed to do better, and he didn't have to do it any other way. It was one of his most unique abilities, and, and, and I love that about him. To me, he was the ultimate, air, the ultimate airman. He, and he had a smile. Uh, Laura said it a while ago. I, I had admired Mark. He had a smile that would light up a room. Laura said, no, he, he had a smile that would take over his face. Uh, and it, and it did. And, and when it took over his face, it, it took over the room and it, and it changed the tenor of a room. Every time he walked into a room, uh, the room was better. Uh, and, and it was fun to be with him. Uh, but it was fun, not because it always, it was easy and just joyful, but it was fun because he was always teaching and we were always learning. Um, he did amazing things throughout his entire life, and you're going to hear them as we go through the videotape. Uh, but I can honestly tell you, and I think DT will agree with this, Jay will agree with this at the end. I think General Hamill, General Shelton, none of us would be here if it wasn't for General Mormon. I would not be the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff without General Mormon. Uh, and so I want to tell just a few things about him. Uh, you're going to hear stories about his humor and stories about his grace and story about his brilliance. Uh, but the one thing I don't think anybody's going to tell you is that, you know, besides being the ultimate gentleman, uh, and that's what I, I got to know him first as the officer and a gentleman, the, the perfect gentleman that you would see. And he was always so gracious and, and always so uh, caring of others. But what I saw uh, when I got to know him better, and this, I got to see it as a captain, which was a very unique experience, is he was, other than my dad, he was about the most competitive person I have ever met. Uh, he literally could not stand to lose at anything. And if you ever played golf with him, or basketball, or anything, and, and when we were on the, the Blue Room Panel for Space in, in 1992, trying to figure out where the Air Force was going to go in space, it was a group of half fighter pilots and, and half what General McPeak fondly referred to as pencil neck geeks. Uh, I was the pencil neck geek, by the way, uh, just to clarify. Uh, but uh, we would work six days a week and on the seventh day we would uh, play a little bit, but his idea of play was go out and golf course or, or go play basketball or go do something. And he would invariably divide the, the group up against so we'd have uh, the pencil neck geeks against the fighter pilots. Uh, and right from the beginning, he just looked me in the eye and said, you understand, uh, we will never lose to the fighter pilots at anything. And I expect you to hold your own weight. And uh, we were playing a basketball game one time, and there's a story that Laura will tell, well, could tell, but she won't today, uh, where uh, he pulled me back uh, from a, a, a short uh, visit with my family. Uh, to make sure I was there to play basketball against the fighter pilots. And I'll just say we were playing and we were doing all right, uh, but uh, I was not being physical enough. Uh, so I'm a little larger than General Mormon, but General Mormon decided that he would show me what it was, what it would take to make sure that we would win. And, and there was a colonel, uh, a very large colonel, and he laid him out with a foul that was just stunning. And the whole place got quiet. And he looked at me and he said, all right, I think you know what to do. Uh, needless to say, we won. But he was, he was so competitive uh, and, it, and gracious at the same time, which was an unbelievable dichotomy of, of a human. Uh, but it was perfect. It was perfect for him. Uh, and I, I love to see that competitive side of him because if you're in our business, uh, there is no such thing as second place. Uh, and General Mormon made sure that, uh, that I knew that, uh, that the United States always had to be dominant in, in the military aspect of everything we do, and that became space. Uh, so 
it's amazing because last last year we lost my mom and dad. We lost Laura's dad, or Laura's mom, and we lost our Mormon, all within just a few months of each other. Sorry, what a day! A year ago today, my mom. Uh, Laura's mom. So it was it was a tough year, uh, but we look back at the memories that were created and the legacy that was left, and it was remarkable. So I want to talk about legacy for just a second, because when I look at the history of military space. And you'll you'll hear others talk about different eras in space, and you'll talk about how they'll talk about how General Mormon fit in the different eras. But to me, there is only two eras so far in military space, and I think we've just started the third, and I don't know where it's going to go. But the first era was the Schriever era, uh, and that was led by General Bernard Schriever, who was the father of space and missiles in the Air Force, who figured out in 1957 that the the future of America depended more on space superiority than did on air superiority, and he. He built the space capabilities, the strategic space capabilities that, that dominated the, the early 60s all the way into the 70s and 80s and, and really brought space to the military forefront. But it was strategic space. But that was the Schriever era. Uh, and, I, I, and the eras overlap, but I see the Schriever era kind of ending in 1982 with the formation of Air Force Space Command and 83, the formation of U.S. Space Command, because then space started to move out. And the next era, the way I look at it, uh, uh, just ended. It ended with the creation of the Space Force and the passing of General Mormon, and that was the Mormon era. Because General Mormon, more than anybody else, because he worked on the NRO side, he worked on the strategic side, he worked on the Air Force side, he saw the need to bring all of space capabilities together to bear on the challenges our nation faced. Uh, and they could be brought to bear at the tactical level, the operational level, the strategic level, nuclear down to small unit activities, uh, humanitarian activities, space was going to become essential to every military operation that we did. And General Mormon saw that, I think, in front of everybody else. And he drove for, for the last 15 years of his career and well into retirement for the next 20 years. He drove that uh, enterprise to fulfill the vision. And the vision ultimately uh, uh, reached maturity with the creation of the United States Space Force. Uh, in December of year before last. And I'm so glad he was here to see it. Uh, so really the way I look at it, it was the, uh, the Shriver era, then the Mormon era. And I don't know who the next era is uh, gonna be, uh, but the next era will be the fruition of what the Space Force can be in the future. And there'll be somebody out there. And it's so important that we can tell the story of General Mormon, just like we told the story of General Shriver for so long, so that everybody remembers where this came from. Because as DT said, uh, I, I, I challenge anybody not to believe that uh, General Thomas S. Mormon Jr. was the father of the Space Force. So last, and certainly not least, we spent a need, you can't think about General Mormon without thinking of Barbara, uh, without thinking about John and, and Tom III. Uh, he was an amazing airman, but he was also an amazing husband and father. And Barbara, you know how he, much he meant to you all the time. And uh, we she feel blessed that. not to just have known uh, your husband and your dad, but we're blessed uh, to have known you uh, and to watch you work uh, with, I'll use the word only once, to work with your Tom uh, to help him achieve the amazing vision that he clearly had at a very young age. Uh, so Barbara, uh, John, Tom, Tommy, I guess. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that we've got to know you. Uh, Laura's glad that she's got to get to know you a little bit closer the last uh, year or so. And we look forward to continuing to know you as time goes on. Uh, but for everybody on the net, uh, we're going to roll the videotape here in just a second, and you're going to see some just amazing stories about an amazing man, an amazing officer, an amazing gentleman, husband and father. And, and so thank you very much for allowing us to do this and give me some time up front. So let's go ahead and, and roll the videotape. Hi, everybody. 
it's great to see everyone today and thank you so much for participating. As you all know, Tom was a very, very social person. He loved his friends, he loved the Air Force, and he would have loved to be here with us today. On behalf of our family, Tommy, John, Amy, and Elizabeth, I want to thank NSSA, Steve, Lisa, the team, and everyone who helped to put it together. I know it has been a labor of love, and we want to thank you all for helping to keep Tom's memory alive. Now sit back and enjoy the presentations. As we celebrate the incomparable life and leadership of General Tom Mormon, I reflect upon his abiding sense of humor and his seemingly easy grasp of even the most complex technical concepts. But even more than his humor and intellect, I celebrate his tutelary spirit. He guarded his Air Force, he protected America's capabilities, and he schooled his colleagues and all of America on the urgent imperative of America's leadership in space. During our decades together on Air Force, Aerospace Corporation, and Space Foundation missions, I learned a doctorate worth of space science from Tom. Barbara, you know better than any of us what a generous human General Tom Mormon was. Thank you and your family for your sacrifices as you shared Tom with the United States Air Force and especially its space components for so many years. General Tom Mormon was an icon. He was the epitome of an Air Force leader and actually a national leader. He was somebody that we all admired and everybody aspired to achieve the kind of things that Tom Mormon achieved. He was a national leader in so many respects, particularly for those of us involved in space programs. Whether you're talking about developing new space systems, defining the architecture for space systems, acquiring space systems, or probably more importantly, using space systems to support military operations, Tom led the way for everybody. He was not only someone to admire, he was the consummate mentor. I can tell you personally that Tom was a mentor to me throughout my career. When I was the commander of the Air Force Space and Missile Center, Tom was the commander of the US Space Command. And he literally guided me as both a customer and a leader on the things I needed to do to support him. When I led the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, Tom was then the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force. And I called upon him constantly to help me and my organization, not only to support the Air Force, but to support other services. And when I had the good fortune to become Vice Chief of Staff, Tom, who had then retired, guided me and taught me literally things to do to be the number two leader in the United States Air Force. On a personal level, Tom and Barbara Mormon were loved by everyone. They always had a smile, always had a helping hand for anybody at any time for any situation. So to me, it is very fitting that there should be a Tom Mormon Institute for Space Studies, comparable, if you will, to the Billy Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, so that future airmen and future guardians will always have something to point the way for space developments for our nation. And I really have to applaud the National Security Space Association, not only for creating this institute, but particularly for the symbology that goes with it. There is a picture of Tom Mormon surrounded by seven stars, four stars to represent the rank he achieved as a general officer, but to me, even more important, three additional stars to represent Barbara Mormon and his two sons, John and Tom Mormon. What a beautiful, beautiful, perfect, perfect picture and a representation of Tom Mormon, his life and his career. Apart from Tom's iconic contributions to national security space, and he and I interacted many times through my career in intelligence and, and his in national security space. And I came obviously to respect his many distinguished qualities, but I thought I'd highlight one and something I really treasure, which is Tom's sense of humor. He is a captivating storyteller. 
And my favorite stories of his were about the GUR, General Jim Hardinger, who was uh, NORAD and Spacecom commander. And I think Tom might have been uh, his exec, perhaps. And he was great at telling GUR stories. In fact, I would prod him to tell them, even though I'd heard them many times, and I laughed every time I heard them. Soon I had the privilege of being next door neighbors with Tom and Barbara when we both lived on Westover Avenue in uh, Bowling Air Force Base before it became a joint base. And the Mormons were kind, gracious, and down to earth. And we became friends, uh, which you know continued into our retired years. Tom was a national treasure who leaves a great and lasting legacy for this country. And most of the, the citizens of the country will not ever know the extent of Tom's contributions. He touched thousands of lives, literally, one of which was mine, and so positively. We'll all miss him. Hi, I'm Mac Thornberry. Big significant change takes time, it takes effort, and it takes visionaries who point the way. I've heard General Mormon's role for space compared with Billy Mitchell's role for air power, but the truth is that Tom Mormon was unique. Without a doubt, General Mormon was a visionary, but he's also responsible for concrete actions during the time in service and thereafter that helped bring that vision about. I remember when the Rumsfeld Space Commission issued its report with a warning that got our attention and a plan of action so we could better protect that domain so vital to the nation's well-being. Because of his background, experience, and gravitas, General Mormon played the crucial role, not only within the commission, but in persuading the rest of us to take it seriously. And we made progress then and since. Admittedly, it's been slow, but the crucial step 16 months ago of making the Space Force a separate branch of the military can in many ways be traced back to that wake up call in 2001 and to General Mormon's substantial influence. It's important to remember and honor those who dedicate their lives to service and duty. It's especially important for us to remind each other of the vision and achievements of those who led the way. It's their example that the next generation and the next will learn from and build on. We're grateful for all that General Mormon did, for the life he lived and the way he lived it. And we're incredibly grateful to his family for their collective service to the nation that made all of his contributions possible. May God continue to bless our nation and those who serve it so faithfully and so well. Hello, I wanna thank Barbara and Tom and John, Tom's daughter-in-law, Amy, his granddaughter, Elizabeth, and the entire Mormon family for giving me this opportunity to say a tribute to my friend, Tom Mormon. In February of 1955, my family was living in Coconut Grove, Florida. My stepfather was in the Air Force and was stationed at Homestead Air Force Base. That month, however, he was transferred to Andrews Air Force Base in Prince George's County, Maryland. That same month, I was enrolled at Suitland High School in Suitland, Maryland as a sophomore. The school was located just a few miles from Andrews. I believe it was the following year, 1956, that Thomas S. Mormon Jr. was enrolled also as a sophomore. Tom's dad, then Brigadier General Thomas S. Mormon, was stationed at Andrews and was heading up the Air Force Weather Service. Soon after Tom and his sister Alan arrived at Suitland, we became good friends and student leaders together. In that year, the dominant student political party was the Ramocrats. Suitland's mascot was the Ram. We were known as the Rams. 
Now, we were not part of that crowd that were the Ramocrats. And so we formed the Rampublicans. Who knew? We won a couple of offices, but not the top offices. However, the next year, 1957, my senior year and Tom's junior year, I was Tom's campaign manager for his winning campaign for president of the student government. Tom's political future at that point looked much clearer than mine. And he was known as a man of great intellect and character with a sense of honor and integrity. From that time, we pretty much went our separate ways. I to the University of Maryland and a year later, Tom to Dartmouth. However, we kept in touch through the years. Tom became an Air Force officer in 1962, and I started Georgetown Law in 1963. I was certainly proud of Tom's steady success and his rise from second lieutenant to being a four-star general, surpassing his distinguished father by one star and becoming vice chief of the Air Force in just 32 years. After I was elected to Congress, we saw one another from time to time. And my wife and I visited Tom in Colorado Springs when he was heading up the Space Command. Tom reflected his father's example of excellence. He was a patriot who loved his country more than self and served it with great skill and success. When the National Geographic Society awarded him its Thomas D. White U.S. Air Force Space Trophy, it cited him as, and I quote, the individual who has made the most outstanding contribution to the nation's progress in space. How extraordinary. On June 26, 1997, I rose on the floor of the House of Representatives to honor my friend Tom Mormon, who is about to retire. I said, the United States is indebted to General Thomas S. Mormon Jr. for selfless service. His skilled and ceaseless efforts have laid a foundation for the Air Force's capabilities in space, which will be a vital part of a strong national security in the 21st century. I was correct then and believe that now. Tom Mormon was a great citizen soldier, but more than that, he was a great and good human being. We who knew him and loved him were blessed. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin McLaughlin, and I had the privilege of serving with, working for, and learning from General Thomas S. Mormon Jr. for over 36 years. My goal today is to share two aspects of General Mormon's life that I believe were, were remarkable. But before I start, I wanted to pass my regards to Mrs. Barbara Mormon and the entire Mormon family, and a heartfelt thank you to the National Security Space Association and all who contributed to today's important event. The first thing I want to comment on was the fact that General Mormon had a front row seat and was a lead actor in our country's national security space program across three distinct eras. First, he played a direct and key role in the National Security Space Program that was birthed during the height of the Cold War and focused almost entirely on support to national leaders inside the Beltway and to our nuclear forces. He also led in the second major era that started when the Cold War ended and the nation broadened its focus to leveraging space capabilities to support operational and tactical military forces. And finally, he led in that era that was focused on how national security space should be organized and managed to meet our nation's vital future challenges. General Mormon was an early pioneer in both airborne and space reconnaissance for the United States. First Lieutenant Tom Mormon was an SR-71 mission planner at the 9th Reconnaissance Wing when the first operational SR-71 touched down at Beale Air Force Base in January of 1966. What a thrill that must have been. Most don't realize that fully one third of General Mormon's long 35 year Air Force career was spent inside the then covert National Reconnaissance Office. His long association with the NRO began in November of 1970 when he started a five year assignment in the Air Force Special Projects Production Facility at Westover Air Force Base, Massachusetts. In 2014, it was approved for public release that this facility process imagery from the Corona hexagon and gambit reconnaissance satellites. From there, he moved to the Pentagon for a four-year assignment to the NRO staff, located in the famous 4C-1000 office spaces, simply nicknamed the suite. 
Here he served as the executive officer to Dr. Hans Mark, the director of the NRO, and later as the NRO's director of plans and policy. He returned to the suite again in 1985 as a one star and the director of the NRO staff, where he worked for NRO director Pete Aldridge and longtime NRO deputy director Jimmy D. Hill. These three assignments totaled almost 11 and a half years of General Mormon's Air Force career. But the nation had more challenges in store for General Mormon as we embarked on the second era of the space, of the national security space. In the midst of a several year debate about the possible creation of a new Air Force Space Command, the Air Force had the foresight to send him to Colorado Springs, where he served in several key space operations and plans roles that immediately preceded the formal standup of Air Force Space Command under General, General James Hardinger in September of 1982. During this period, he served as the GERS uh, CAG director during the first two critical years in the life of this new command. I first met then Colonel Mormon during this period when I was a second lieutenant in the Space Defense Operations Center, we called it the SPADOC, deep inside Cheyenne Mountain, and he would give the GERS SPADOC briefing during tours. Later, Lieutenant General Mormon returned to Colorado Springs in the 1990 timeframe, eight years after the creation of Air Force Space Command, and what a momentous time that proved to be. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait later in 1990, and we executed Operation Desert Storm in early 1991 to eject him. Desert Storm was called by many our first space war, and the Air Force Space Command under General Mormon's steady hand delivered countless historic firsts. First ever GPS military support uh, to warfighters in combat, tactical weather predictions, focused military satellite communication support, and the list goes on. In one instant, he led a sea state change in how the military thinks about using space to its advantage and enabled an entirely new form of U.S. conventional concepts of war. General Mormon's unique talents were recognized again in 1994 when he was promoted to four-star rank and was made Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, the number two uniformed officer in our service. This period marked the entry into the third major era of General Mormon's career that was focused on how national security space should be organized and managed to meet current and future needs. While the creation of the U.S. Space Force was the ultimate manifestation of that work, its DNA was laid over 25 years, starting with General Mormon's time as Vice Chief. His collaboration with Secretary of the Air Force Sheila Widnall and Chief of Staff of the Air Force Ron Fogelman resulted in a new Air Force vision that stated the Air Force would transition, quote, from an Air Force to an Air and Space Force on an evolutionary path towards a space and Air Force. These were very bold words at the time, but the move toward a space and Air Force was put on hold after all three of these senior leaders departed government service. In 2000, three years after his retirement from active duty, General Mormon, along with General Fogelman again, and a number of other experts were called to serve as commissioners on the Rumsfeld Space Commission. I was a lieutenant colonel at the time and the only active duty member of the Space Commission staff. The commission spent six months conducting the most thorough look at the nation's national security space enterprise and made 13 strategic recommendations, including recommendations that started the Air Force along the path to enable a future decision to create a Space Corps and later a Space Force. For reasons too numerous to cover today, the government failed to systemically implement most of the Commission's recommendations. However, as the debate reared its head again during the President Obama's second term, General Mormon remained a trusted and close advisor to leaders in the Air Force, the White House, and on the Hill as the possible U.S. Space Force was being debated. Then in December 20, uh, on December 20th, 2019, just seven months before General Mormon's death, the Congress passed the National Defense Authorization Act that established the U.S. Space Force and it was signed into law by the President. We all consider General Bernard Schriever as the father of space and the Air Force, but I hope you'll agree with me that General Thomas S. Mormon Jr. was the father of the modern Air Force space era and of the new U.S. Space Force. My remarks would not be complete if I didn't say just a few things about my personal experiences with General Mormon as a man who lived a life of distinction in the broadest sense of the word. He showed everyone that knew him that living such a life was about much more than rank or position. It was about living a life marked by core principles such as service to others, selflessness, kindness, humility, 
deep personal relationships, and enduring principles such as his commitment to Barbara and his family. General Mormon was my hero in the truest sense of the word, not just because of the great things he did in the Air Force and in his professional life, but because of the kind of man he was. He stood up and was counted when the nation needed him most, and the needs were great and the sacrifices were many. But through it all, he lived a life of distinction that taught those of us who knew him we could do the same. Thank you very much for uh, your attendance today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. I'm Bill Geiger, uh, a lifelong friend of Tom's, at least adult life. And I wanted to express my uh, insight into uh, who Tom was and how it was, how it felt like working with a man of this uh, character and stature. First of all, uh, I spent my 20 years in the Air Force, retired, <clears throat> and worked with Tom as a first lieutenant and then again as a major and lieutenant colonel later in the Pentagon as co-workers. And uh, subsequently after that, another almost 20 years as a support contractor where I had started a company called Aegis Research Corporation. The context of my relationship uh, at a professional level with Tom has always been in extreme secrecy. Uh, that is a unique relationship that uh, for those uh, who might be listening who have spent uh, their lives or their time or portions of their career in that environment know that there are special demands placed on uh, people in that environment where the missions are exceedingly high priority very, very sensitive and urgent. And the, the people who work in that environment and learn from that environment are the ones that actually spent their early formative years on the front line of the intelligence Cold War. It was a compelling time. There was not much room for errors and it required courage and perseverance and, and, the, and the other, uh, many other character traits that uh, really spell character and integrity. And most of all, the most paramount of all was trust. What was it like working at Beale when the SR-71 operation was open? <clears throat> I think it's important to remember how high priority that program was and its origins and what the roles and relationships were and how small the team was. The, that circumstance were, was a classic Cold War thing where urgent programs had, had high secrecy requirements and a team is assembled young and old, but all experienced in their own way. Even the young people, by the time I went there, for example, I had already been a flight commander to a, an Asian uh, signals intercept operation and deeply involved in almost all of our peripheral re airborne reconnaissance programs. And <clears throat> I came there as a, a very young, First Lieutenant, Tom and, and the other people who was responsible for imagery processing, imagery analysis, target selections, um, uh, route planning, and creation of the, of the, uh, the, the cockpit uh, route planning guides uh, was, it, 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 it was very intimate. And, and very tight crowd. All were uh, capable. Uh, the pilots were special, special backgrounds. 
I was assigned as a, uh, NRO representative uh, to interface uh, NRO operations and their SOC 71 in security, communications, and things like that, intelligence support. Uh, so it was a complex group of very capable, young, and old, experienced people uh, combined to form a very tight, tight, trusted environment for people. That environment is classic Cold War frontline intelligence work. And that is a formative um, kind of an experience that carries people through their lifetime. It was reinforced uh, uh, later in the, in the NRO, same kind of experience. Uh, same kind of relationship, same kind of environment. Uh, very complicated, uh, deep experiences as young people. In 1975, Major Mormon moved from Westover to the Pentagon. As good as he had been in dealing with product and doing operational support, he was even better as he moved into policy and planning. He was assigned to SAF SS, or was better known 4C1000, or simply the suite. Back then, the NRO was still a black organization, unacknowledged. The programs were executed by programs A, B, and C, and SAF SS was the unacknowledged NRO director's staff in Washington. Towards the end of that tour, by then Lieutenant Colonel Mormon was the NRO's representative to the Space Mission Organizational Planning Study, or SMOPS. I expect it was probably his first in-depth exposure to military or white space systems, just as it was the first exposure to the NRO for several of us on the study, me included. It was obvious that he was probably the quickest study I'd ever known. Within a couple of weeks, he was not only conversant with all the Air Force and other service nuances that eventually led to the formation of Air Force Space Command, he was the principal drafter of the SMOPS report. That he was on a fast track was clear with his next assignment to the National War College in 1979 and then as the space military assistant to the secretary of the Air Force, Dr. Hans Mark, who had been the undersecretary and the director of the NRO while Tom was in the suite. I don't know much about what he did then. His stories about that assignment dealt mostly with traveling with Dr. Mark, red eye, coach seat, commercial flights between Washington and Los Angeles. If Tom hadn't embraced long hours before that tour, he sure had it after. Bye. It was my great pleasure to know Tom for 45 years. Our careers paralleled each other and we were great social friends as well. We first met when we were both in the NRO staff in the mid-1970s. And during that time, we were assigned the task of producing the first congressional justification book for the NRO. I remember a group of us around the table handing out assignments to get this job done, when one of the officers from our studies organization was really unhappy about being asked to take on such a task, thought he had more important things to do, complained bitterly, emoted for a couple of minutes, got embarrassing, finally stopped and there was a silence, nobody knew what to say. Tom said, so does this mean you're not going to help us? Well, everybody laughed, including the complaining officer, who immediately acknowledged, oh, yes, yes, I'll help. A few years later, Tom was the deputy military assistant to the secretary of the Air Force. I was over visiting uh, one afternoon about 4 o'clock. A young officer came in and handed Tom a, uh, a staff package, explained how important it was, asked if he could get it back the same day, and then said, if I come back at 5.30, sir, will you be here? Tom raised his head slowly and deepened his voice to say, Yes, I'll be here at 5.30. The officer caught the point and said, yes, yeah, I understand, sir, it's probably very hard to get out of here before 7 or later. 
And then they both acknowledge that life in the Pentagon was a life of long hours. So Tom moved from there through a range of important space assignments, including command of the Air Force Space Command. And in 1994, he was made the Vice Chief of Staff. This was a very unusual position for a non-rated officer. And General McPeak had selected him for the role because he realized after the first Gulf War that space was far more important to the Air Force than had ever been understood, and that he needed to do something about it. He was going to look to Tom, probably the only man at the time with both operational and acquisition experience, to lead that change for the Air Force. But during his swearing-in assignment, General McPitt noted how unusual it was for a non-rated officer to become the vice chief. And he said, we have not done this since 1967. So we do not do this often, nor should we. But Tom went on to, to a range of civilian pursuits, stayed closely involved uh, with the Air Force and with space, and in just recent years, played a useful role as an articulate supporter for a space force. This was a long and illustrious career, both military and civilian. And it was my great privilege to know him over many of those years. Good afternoon. I met Tom Mormon some 40 years ago when I entered the Pentagon in 1981 as the Undersecretary of the Air Force and the director of the National Reconnaissance Office, the then super secret organization for the development, launch, and operations of our spy satellites. From that point on, I worked very closely with Tom as he passed through the ranks to become Mr. Space. And I fully support all the honors and awards attributed to him during his distinguished career. Tom was deeply involved in planning to establish the Air Force Space Command. Along with Tom, in September 1982, I was there representing the Secretary of the Air Force, uh, passing the new Space Command flag to the new commander, General James Hardinger. Tom would later become the fifth commander of this organization. This new command would later become the foundation of the Space Force that we have today. At that time, it was the policy of the United States the Space Shuttle become the exclusive launch vehicle for all national security, civil, and commercial satellites. All expendable launch vehicles would be phased out when the shuttle became operational. The first shuttle launch was in April of 1981. After the first four launches, it became clear that the shuttle would not be able to meet all the performance requirements for launching our national security payloads. We needed to retain production of expendable launch vehicles until the shuttle could prove itself capable of meeting our national security needs. Tom helped me develop a plan to provide for expendable backup or a complement to the shuttle which would consist of the Air Force buying 10 complementary ELVs and launch them twice a year. Tom helped me implement the new change in space launch mixed fleet, fleet policy, which eventually was approved by the President Reagan. And it was a good thing because in January 1986, with the Challenger accident, a need for a complement to the shuttle was proven. We increased the production of existing expendable launch vehicles, and Tom led a study recommending the development of a new evolved expendable launch vehicle, or EELV. That study was the basis for the EELV fleet of Atlas and Delta variants that we have today. One more Tom Mormon story. Many years ago, we had a satellite failure on orbit 
that time we were using a film return system and the failure could result in a situation where we could not determine where the satellite would land. We mobilized the worldwide space tracking facilities, recovery aircraft, and many naval vessels to cover likely areas of reentry. It took a lot of effort, but we were successful. We drafted a letter to be signed by President Reagan that would thank all the facilities and people who participated in this effort for their extraordinary performance. I got the signed letter transcribed to a plaque and Tom and I hand delivered the plaque to each of our space facilities worldwide. After his retirement from the Air Force, Tom continued his advocacy for national security space systems and the organizations and industries that supported them. We will miss Tom Mormon, my golfing buddy. By 1981, the Soviet Union was doing nearly 100 space launches a year and had an operational anti-satellite system that they tested often. NORAD ADCOM had activated in early phases of a space defense operations center and Colonel Mormon, Barbara and the boys made their first move to Colorado Springs to become the director of space operations in Cheyenne Mountain. The commander in chief NORAD at the time was General James V. Hardinger and he and Tom saw a lot of each other. General Hardinger knew a good thing when he saw it and it wasn't long before Tom was moved downtown to the headquarters. First as part of the gang of seven staff officers that did the legwork leading to the activation of Air Force Space Command and then as the head of the GERS commanders group. That first commander's group, or CX, was unique. It isn't much of an overstatement to say that every word that General Hardinger spoke on space and space command leading, leading up to the activation of the command or for almost two years after was either written by or discussed in depth with his CX, Tom Mormon. The command briefing was known to those few who were authorized to give it by the GER verbatim as the perfect pitch. Colonel Mormon, Mormon planned a one-year tour working directly for General Hardinger, but it was extended to two. With the GERS retirement in 1984, Tom moved to the first base wing as the vice commander and was selected for Brigadier General. He pinned on his first star with less than 23 years service and less than four years in grade as a Colonel. As would be the case throughout his career, those of us who worked with him or for him, loved him, loved his family, Loved his sense of humor, his common sense, and his leadership. I first met Tom Mormon in 1978. He was assigned as a staff officer at the National Reconnaissance Office, and I was assigned to the Air Staff Director of Plans. The subject of space militarization was really heating up at that time, thanks to the interest of some senior officers such as General Jim Hill, Bruce Brown and Tom Brandt. At that time, the Air Defense Command was going out of business, except for that one tiny area of space operations that the command had been doing for a number of years. But even that mission had been transferred to Strategic Air Command in Omaha. Eventually, the subject of the Space Command came up and got some traction within the air staff thanks to the leadership efforts of Jerry O'Malley, who believed that space focused too narrowly on strategic programs rather than also looking at their support to space to tactical op op applications. So they gave me a small group of about 25 officers from across the Air Force and the other major commands and told us to lay out organizations for space operations. Tom Mormon was one of the key planners in that small organization. We worked for about three months and came up with six options in the Space Mission Operational Planning Study on how to organize space operations. Unfortunately, the Chief of Staff at that time couldn't see his way clear to form a new command, so he chose option seven. We would do nothing. So. The commands, the group slogged on for another three years until the spring of 1982. By that time, General Mormon had been assigned to the Space Defense Center, Space Ops. 
President Reagan's strategic defense initiative was working behind the scenes. So that got a lot of interest in space, as well as the fact that a second satellite control facility was to be built in Colorado Springs. We now know that as Schreiber Air Force Base. The notion of a major command for space ops continued to grow. At that time, there were only three real contenders, Strategic Air Command in Omaha, Air Force Systems Command in, in Virginia, and or we could form a new space command. General Hardinger, who had now replaced General Hill as commander of NORAD, wanted a small group to do the planning for the command. So he limited the effort to seven of us to do the planning for a new command. And we worked our buns off to keep up with the flow of information and planning that was flowing in. General Moreland became General Hardinger's go-to guy. Writing, giving speeches, doing papers, traveling with him to Washington, and a ton of other extra duties. In the end, it was a work briefing that General Harding gave to the Air Force in May 1982 to create a space command and to place it in Colorado Springs. So it's been nearly 40 years since that stand up and the growth of space missions continued. Well, the best Tom Mormon stories were the ones he told himself. He was a great storyteller. I think Marty Fig and I heard most of them, some several times when we got together with our wives. They would always put us together at the far end of the table so we wouldn't, so they wouldn't interrupt us. Usually Tom started with, stop me, if I've told you this one before, but we never stopped him. We weren't just being polite. We truly enjoyed the stories and there were lots and lots of stories. Stories about living in post-war Japan, his days at Beale and about his dad, the real General Norman, introducing him to General Schriever well before Tom got into the space business. Tom's space-related story started in 1975 when he was first assigned to the National Reconnaissance Office. He thought of himself as an intelligence officer, but he clearly and quickly made his mark as a space leader. He was totally committed to the mission and the business at hand, but he was always ready to have a little fun, which made the stories even more enjoyable. During that first tour in the NRO, Tom began what would become a continuing involvement in countless studies, reviews, commissions, and other significant deliberations on space issues. In fact, it has been said that he never saw a study he didn't like. He earned a nickname professor for some of his efforts. But he either led or directly influenced most of the significant space studies for the following 40 years, a truly remarkable legacy. That involvement helped build a unique personal insight of the history encasing the development of our nation's space capabilities. He, on, he not only knew what happened, he knew why it happened and would explain how that would influence later events. He was a devoted student of history. He applied his knowledge through his personal support to several Air Force secretaries and chiefs, NRO directors, other leaders in the Department of Defense, intelligence community, NASA, Congress, industry, the ensuing respect he earned was not just because of his knowledge, but even more because of his unwavering candor and rock solid integrity. Tom Mormon could say the baby was ugly with a lot of charm and an equal amount of wit. But as significant as his influence was on the evolution of our nation's space programs, I think Tom had even greater personal influence on his friends, peers, and those he led and mentored, often using a story to make a point. So let me tell a Tom Mormon story. Back in the day when we had lots of Dons in the space leadership position, Secretary Rice, Generals Cotina, Cromer, Henderson, Mirth, me, Tom, two-star General Mormon, brought the house down when he extended a special recognition to General Four-Star Randolph, who was sitting, who was in the audience attending a symposium along with a lot of us Dons. When Tom started his speech, he said he was extremely impressed that General Randolph could do so well in space, even without the first name Don. Classic Mormon humor. General, Moore, General Randolph was quite amused. I feel extremely fortunate to have enjoyed Tom's comradeship over the years. I know I speak for many others when I say we truly cherish his friendship and his stories. Good afternoon. First, let me thank Don Hart and the rest of the folks at NSSA for giving me the opportunity to participate in this tribute to Tom Mormon. 
Uh, Tom and I first met in the early 1980s when we were both in the NRO. Uh, Tom was on the staff and I was a SPO director in Program C. Uh, our paths intersected many, many times after that uh, initial meeting through Tom's successful Air Force career and also post-retirement at, at Booz Allen. In addition to our professional relationship, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to know Tom on a social basis, personal basis, on a number of occasions. Several of these do stand out in my memory, and no, they're probably not necessarily reflected in his official biography. First, to set the background, it turns out that Tom and I had the same date of rank. Tom's promotion to brigadier and my promotion to, at the time, Commodore. I do note that our promotion dates rapidly diverged after that point in time. Uh, anyway, the two newly minted O7s had several opportunities to travel with Pete Aldridge to visit some worldwide facilities. Now, the fact that some of these facilities were close to famous golf courses was a very fortunate coincidence. Uh, I don't know, and I do, and I do recall uh, Barbara one day uh, with a look of puzzlement at Andrews Air Force Base as some of the extra baggage was being loaded for our trip. I don't know what influence Tom had on the actual itineraries, but it seemed like we always had time for R&R &R and an occasional early morning round at St. Andrews. I also recall one other occasion at an Air Force base when we were checking out of the VOQ one morning, and Tom seemed very, very upset about the accommodations that he had been assigned. Uh, I was surprised because my accommodations were just fine, uh, spacious and well-appointed. It turned out that, that, that the rooms had been assigned based on seniority uh, and his date of rank. And in the case of a tie, the better rooms apparently went to the senior service. I did tell Tom at that time he should have looked into the NROTC unit at Dartmouth when he was there. In conclusion, I'm, I'm really honored to have known and worked with Tom for a number of years. His contributions to his impact on the national security space arena are absolutely unsurpassed. I'm sure I'm the only, uh, the token squid in this tribute. So I take great pleasure in broadcasting our traditional recognition for a job well done. Bravo Zulu, Tom Mormon. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity of honoring Tom Mormon. Tom was the epitome of an officer and a gentleman. I had the honor of meeting with him and working with him in the 1980s when he was chief of staff of the NRO office in the Pentagon. And I was at CIA as a deputy director for science and technology and had a second job, which was director of program B of the NRO. The world posed a number of challenges for our nation in those days, and the NRO was charged with collecting intelligence from space against our adversaries and general, general knowledge of the world situation. The Air Force Program A and the CIA Program B were competitors, and there were some strong programmatic arguments back and forth. And Tom Mormon, with his calmness, was always providing the guidance that moved the NRO and the nation towards successful results. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Steve, for doing this and allowing us to pay tribute to General Mormon and to share a few personal memories about such an inspirational leader. As I was thinking about my comments today, I recalled the first time I met General Mormon. 
Believe it or not, it was in the early 1980s. At that time, the director of ODE, Bob Kohler, asked me to interview for a position on the NRO staff as a program element monitor for a few of the ODE programs. Not having a strong knowledge of the programs or a technical background, needless to say, this gave me great pause. Nevertheless, I went on the interview. After spending some time with General Mormon, we both agreed that it was probably not in either of our interests for me to take this position, and so we informed our management. Others felt differently, however, and much to both of our surprises, I joined the staff. After a few days, I had my initial office call with General Mormon, and after expressing our dismay, we talked about how we could make this work. He agreed to teach me all about DOD and the Air Force, and I tried to explain to him more and more about CIA. He was true to his word and often would spend great time with me explaining everything from how to draft a point paper to the organizational structure of the Air Force or the NRO. He also explained each of the various programs under the auspices of the NRO in great detail. For that, I will be forever thankful. Uh, he really helped me become successful in an environment that was new to me and one that I didn't understand. As time went on on the staff, uh, I noticed that he did this with many, many people. And that to me was truly uh, inspirational. The time I spent on the staff was among the very best in my career. The environment created by General Mormon and Jimmy Hill was absolutely extraordinary. It was purposeful, it was mission focused. It was an environment where our leadership played to each individual's strengths. We all worked hard and everyone contributed. While there were definitely differences in experiences, perspectives, and the position of the organizations we represented, candor, openness, integrity, and loyalty were valued and appreciated by our leadership. Teamwork was expected. The culture thrived, and I've never seen an organization that was better led or more fun to be a part of. And it's an experience I will never forget. I first became aware of General Mormon in 1979. He was leaving the NRO staff, and I was beginning my ASTRA assignment in Air Force RD. The Air Force Space Mission Operations Planning Study, led by Lieutenant General Malley, had just completed, and debates were raging about the future of space in the Air Force including the space shuttle, space defense program, creation of a space command. Everyone said General Mormon had a sizable impact on the study. They also expected he would be a major leader in the years ahead. The first time I actually met him was 1987 when I was a PIM in AQ. And I was sent down to the NRO staff in 4C-1000 to convince him to release a colonel in the NRO for an important classified program. After a pretty intense grilling, he agreed but I then learned you better do your homework and that he really cared about personnel matters. As luck would have it, he came to AQS shortly after, and despite our rough early encounter, we developed a great relationship. In 1988, he asked me to become his exec. I had some trepidation, of course, because he was known as the exec's exec, but I understood it was a great opportunity. I later learned that Barbara kept a pretty close eye though, ensuring that the exec could leave at a decent time. To that point in my career, I had mostly worked in classified areas and had little understanding of the depth and breadth of issues across space in the Air Force. And it was a time of great challenge for military space. Recovery from multiple launch failures, including Challenger, the stand-up of the Strategic Defense Initiative, the growing role of space in the Cold War, transfers of space missions, responsibilities, and people from Air Force Systems Command to Air Force Space Command, and then the fall of the Berlin Wall. Every day was a wild ride. At this time, it was clear General, was the mo General Mormon was the most knowledgeable and trusted senior space expert and advisor in the Pentagon. The role of space in the Air Force was growing, and he was sought out to advise everyone in the Air Force, OSD, the White House, and Congress. It was little surprise that General Mormon was selected to command Air Force Space Command in 1990 and promoted to Lieutenant General. As Desert Shield Desert Storm kicked off in August of 1990, space was at the forefront. Missile warning, GPS, satellite communications, weather information 
were to play vital roles. And Air Force Base Command had to shift from near total focus on strategic operations to supporting coalition forces and operations. Shortly after the expulsion of Iraqi forces from Kuwait, the Soviet Union collapsed, leading to massive changes in threats, forces, resources, and the defense industry throughout all of the decade of the 90s, and no more so than in space. General Mormon was at the forefront, and we and his plans office were kept very busy. Organizational changes, shift from strategic to theater focus, modernizing space while budgets and people decline. General Mormon was literally at the epicenter of the most vexing problems. Then Chief of Staff General McPeak developed a keen interest in space to the extent that he actually changed the mission of the Air Force to become the control and exploitation of air and space. But the Air Force needed an action plan for space and a space blue ribbon panel was established and General Mormon was to lead it. 30 people from across the Air Force decamped to Maxwell Air Force Base for three months to learn about, debate, and make recommendations about the future of space. Some young veterans of this study include Willie Shelton and John Hyten. The most far reaching of the conclusions of the studies that was that while the Air Force had by far the largest share of space missions, responsibilities, and people in the DOD, it lagged other services in using space. Among the most important results were the creation of the Space Warfare Center and the growth of space and theater warfare. It paved the way for innovations such as new precision GPS guided munitions, the JDAM, global operations and intelligence broadcasts, and combat search and rescue and blue force tracking. One of the most difficult space issues at the time was space launch. Launch rates were declining, costs were growing, Industry was consolidating, international competition was growing, and interagency cooperation was limited. The DOD and the Air Force needed a plan, and General Mormon was once again asked to develop it. The DOD Space Launch Study of 1994 gathered stakeholders across DOD, intelligence community, NASA, and industry, and examined and debated a wide variety of options and developed strategies which led to renewed cooperation across the agencies and the birth of the evolved expendable launch vehicle, the ELV program. Most important, he sold the recommendations and programs across the DOD, the interagency and the Congress, which led to the launch program for a quarter century. For those of you I don't know, I'm Willie Shelton. Uh, I retired from active duty in the summer of 2014 as the commander of Air Force Space Command. I first met General Mormon in the Pentagon in 1988 he was uh, the SAP AQS, of course, at the time, and I was working space policy for Dick McCormick. Somehow he got it stuck in his head that my name was really Woody, not Willie, but Woody, which became the joke around the Pentagon, and I'm sure many of you watching this program will remember that. Uh, in 1990, he moved on to Air Force Space Command as the commander, and I moved uh, later that summer into the GPS squadron at Falcon Air Force Base. Many, many tours he led through the GPS master control station. And if he wasn't leading the dignitaries through, then his wife, Barbara, was uh, leading uh, the spouses through the master control station. And I'm quite sure that by the time uh, I was through as the commander anyway, he or Barbara, either one, could have led one of those tours. In 1992, the only thing I can think of is he must have run out of executive officer candidates because he picked me to be his exec and I was truly honored to have that job. He uh, was tasked in that fall, uh, later on in that fall, to run a blue ribbon panel on space at beautiful Montgomery, Alabama, uh, Maxwell Air Force Base. And we s spent 60 days down there looking out at all aspects of space and the organizational structures and such. He had a chart that he put together that looked like a Navajo blanket, so to speak, with a lot of different colors on it showing the organizations and what their responsibilities were. And uh, General McPeak looked at that chart and said, well, that looks like a dog's breakfast. Well, needless to say, that chart had no other name after that. I have so many fond memories. Time just doesn't allow me to go through all of them. But I want you to know that I always saw General Mormon behave as a true gentleman in every sense of the word. Uh, he, was, he was a kind man, a gentle man a terrific storyteller, wonderful sense of humor. He was clearly the space expert we all wanted to be 
like General Mormon. Uh, he was a mentor to so many of us, and later on in life, he became a really, really good friend. By the way, no matter how he was feeling personally throughout all his illness, he always asked me about Linda, my wife. Devoted husband and father, a role model on how to treat your wife. Uh, I've never heard anybody say anything bad about General Mormon. Uh, Barbara, I know you and the boys dearly miss him, and so do I. Short of my immediate family, I can't think of anyone else who's had such an impact on my life, um, and I, I'm grateful for it. I'm also grateful for every moment I had to spend with Tom Warren. Tom Mormon was a very highly respected officer uh, in the parts of the Air Force that didn't know a heck of a lot about space. We all knew that he was sort of Mr. Spaceman. So, uh, and I in particular was very impressed by the role that, the combat role, I would say, that space uh, played in 1991 and during Desert Storm. I mean, systems like GPS, <laughs> right? For the first time ever, uh, the Army knew precisely where it was on the ground. And believe me, that makes a difference when you try to deliver closer support. And by the way, they knew what time it was precisely for the first time in the history of armed conflict. So. So it wasn't just overhead photography and communications and all that stuff, but systems like GPS that now everybody knows about, because we all have it in our automobile, but in those days, kind of a real eye opener, how important space systems were to the combat operations of the terrestrial forces. So uh, when Mike Carnes retired as uh, vice chief, it was very easy for me and others uh, to think about making Tom a four-star and bringing him to Washington to be the vice chief. Now, just remember that, I don't know, we may have had uh, uh, 20 vice chiefs in the history of the Air Force at that time, and almost every single one of them was a pilot, okay? So this was unusual to bring a what we call a non-rated officer, not a pilot, not a navigator, uh, not an air crew, you know, by, by profession, brought him to Washington and gave him the number two job in the Air Force. That's indicative of two things. One, how important space was becoming to us, but two, what a, a capable officer uh, Tom Mormon was. Uh, and, uh, you know, he didn't disappoint. He continued to be, uh, uh, you know, really value added uh, officer in, in his new role as vice chief. The capabilities of the Department of the Air Force in space rest upon the shoulders of General Tom Mormon. I interacted with him on quite a personal level when he was vice chief of staff of the Air Force, a position he came to in 1994, just after I became secretary in 1993. By this time, it was apparent to the Air Force that capabilities in space were an important part of the Air Force's approach to the ability to pursue global challenges. We both left the Air Force in 1997, so we had a significant amount of overlap and mutually shared interests, specifically about the importance of space capability to the mission of the Air Force. GPS was just coming on board and the Air Force was launching a significant number of satellites for a variety of missions. In 1996, General Fogelman and I developed global engagement, a vision for the 21st century Air Force. An important statement in that document is the observation about the increasing importance of space capabilities. It reads, we are now transitioning from an air force into an air and space force on an evolutionary path to a space and air force. 
Well, it didn't quite turn out that way, but it is clear with the establishment of the Space Force that space capabilities are an essential component of the military capabilities of the Department of the Air Force. General Mormon's experience was founded upon his role as head of the Air Force Space Command, a structure that maintains its importance today, becoming the basis for the establishment of the Space Force. Another important commitment to the importance of capability in space to the Air Force mission occurred in those years. At that point, there had been a significant number of launch failures, and it was clear that we needed a program to develop new launch vehicles. In 1995, we began the EELV program, which provided launch capabilities for military missions. We chose two launch vehicles, the Delta IV and the Atlas V. It has been a very successful program with close to 100 launches without a failure. Now we have another turning of the page with the commercial development of new launch vehicles. Looking back upon this, it is clear that General Mormon had a very important and lasting impact upon the Air Force and its capabilities to missions in space. Hi, I'm Ron Fogelman, and I'm really honored to be able to be part of this tribute to uh, General Tom Mormon. Um, I, I grew up in a different part of the Air Force than Tom did, and so uh, we really didn't meet until we were colonels was on my first tour in the Pentagon. At that time, uh, Tom was working as the deputy military assistant to the secretary of the Air Force, who happened to be Hans Mark. And uh, I was chairman of the TAC panel, and I suspect because of the classification or something, but this program came before the TAC panel. It was a pretty sizable bit of uh, money, uh, about $180 million in the first year, and then it really ramped up as it went forward. And so I asked the question, what's this program do? And I said, well, it's a, it's a space program and um, we can't talk a whole lot about it. And I said, well, uh, just tell me fundamentally what it does. And they said, well, it's a, it's a navigation program. And being a wise guy, I said, well, I, you know, I'm a pilot. I haven't been lost in the last five years. So I'm not sure why we need a new navigation program. And so the panel proceeded to cut the program and uh, move on. And uh, it was about two hours later that Tom Mormon showed up at my door and said, okay, uh, Fogelman, uh, I'm gonna take you down here to the third floor. I'm gonna take you behind the green door and I'm, I'm gonna tell you some things. And so that was the beginning of our relationship in a sense, in terms of working together on uh, space matters. And I was fortunate enough to get briefed uh, on, on several of the things uh, well in advance of a lot of other uh, folks. Uh, as it turned out then, uh, Tom and I were on the same BG list and uh, we ended up going to charm school together, which is where I had the opportunity first to see him uh, in a social environment, see what a gentleman he was. And uh, then uh, the next time we came together was after the first Gulf War in 1991, when I was out in Korea as the desync and the air Com uh, air component commander uh, working for a, a great army four-star by the name of Bob Ruskasi. And Ruskasi was a great friend of Norm Schwarzkopf's. And during the first Gulf War and afterwards, Ruskasi and Schwarzkopf talked often. And Ruskasi was very interested in, in what were the things that made them so successful in the Middle East. And Schwarzkopf uh, was, uh, was, uh, really had nothing but praise for the contributions that uh, that space made. And so Ruskasi asked me uh, if I could get in touch with the smartest guy I knew in the space business and have him come out to Korea and tell us what we needed to do to build the space capabilities that Schwarzkopf had in the Middle East during that first Gulf War. So uh, I was, uh, you know, I contacted Tom and at that time, I think he was the commander of Air Force Space Command, and I briefed him on the situation. And he he said uh, he'd he'd look into it, and then uh, said, "Okay, I'm I'm ready to come out and uh, talk to you guys." And uh, so uh, Tom came out, and he he said uh, the, the bottom line in his story was uh, amazingly enough, 
you guys have just about everything here on the peninsula that Norm Schwarzkopf had to build uh, from scratch in the Middle East. And uh, you just don't know about it. And uh, that was because of the classification and, and we had the lack of interfaces and this sort of thing. And Tom explained, you know, what it would take to, to get all this up and running. Uh, a little side story, uh, I, I know that, that the uh, Defense Meteorological Satellite Program uh, was of immense uh, help to them in, in figuring out what was happening across the battlefield. And uh, it turned out that uh, for years at uh, Osan Air Base, on the second hole of the golf course, it was this fenced in area that if you hit a golf ball in there, you couldn't go in and pick it up. And uh, we never knew what it was. Nobody would tell us what it was. And it turned out that it was a downlink station for the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program. So it was just an example of how things in those days were still pretty well uh, compartmented. And, and uh, a lot of the folks in the field who needed the information uh, that national security space could provide just uh, weren't getting it. But because of Tom's trip out there and the, and the uh, way he went about explaining how we could work this, and then the fact that he went back and worked it made a big difference in, uh, in what we thought our capabilities would be in the event of a conflict on the, on the uh, peninsula. Well, first of all, what an honor it is to participate in this National Security Space Association tribute to General Thomas Mormon, Jr. I've had the unique opportunity to serve with three generations of the Mormon family. Lieutenant General Thomas Mormon Sr. was a superintendent at the Academy when I served as a cadet wing commander. And he also commissioned me in June of 1968. John Mormon, Tom Mormon's son, served with me for over 15 years in Armed Forces Benefit Association. And I can tell you that in every case, the apple does not fall far from the tree. When you think of General Mormon, you think of a giant of a man, husband, father, grandfather, mentor, friend, leader, officer, space professional. When you think of his attributes, traits, I believe, because they seem to come so natural to him, a great listener, a very kind and gentle man, someone who gave him everything he possibly could to take care of his, of his people. I think he personified the servant leader well before the term was coined. Some might think with the advent of the Space Force, the reconstitution of the United States Space Command, that General Mormon was born three generations too late. I beg to differ. I believe without General Mormon becoming the General Schriever of his generation and promoting space as he did, operational national security, that we would not have the Space Force today, that we would not have reconstituted U.S. Space Command. This nation and its citizens owe a great debt of gratitude to General Mormon. We were all better off because he touched our lives. A special thanks to the Mormon family for their service to this great nation. God bless. I'm Ellen Polakowski, and I first met Tom Mormon when I was a colonel working in the Office of the Secretary of Defense in the 1990s. He was the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and the Secretary of Defense had asked our office to present to the service vice chiefs an assessment that we had done on chemical and biological defense preparedness by all the services. And let's just say that the presentation was not exactly well received. In fact, I ranked the experience up there as one of the most challenging presentations I gave and probably one of the worst experiences of my Air Force career. After I returned to my office, I received a call from General Mormon's office asking me to participate in 
a presentation to Secretary Widnall that Saturday morning to review the results of the study. So I dutifully showed up Saturday morning and General Mormon escorted me in. And for the next two hours, we went over in great detail the results of the study and discussed with the secretary what were some of the options that the Air Force needed to take. And General Mormon really led the way. He took the time and was very patient in going through the results and providing her the opportunity to ask questions. And I realized afterwards that there were really two purposes for that meeting. The first was that General Mormon really was concerned that the Air Force needed to address the issues that were brought up, and he wanted to give Secretary Widnall a thorough understanding of what was going on. But it also was a mentoring and a rebluing session for me. He showed me how to go through a very difficult and challenging presentation and present it in a light that was perhaps not as antagonistic as it had unfortunately resulted to in the original briefing. And really that's what Tom Mormon was all about. It reflected the two things that I think I saw in the many years afterwards that I got to know General Mormon that were so important to him. One was his dedication to the service, air and space. It didn't matter to General Mormon. And two was that of taking care of, mentoring and preparing the future Air Force leaders of, for the Air Force and now the Space Force. And that's what General Mormon was all about, a caring, determined outlook on the future of the Air Force and of course our Space Force. Godspeed, Tom Mormon. We are all gonna miss you. When I was chairing a study that uh, ended up in the formation of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, now NGA, Tom was the chief of staff, vice chief of staff of the Air Force. And I went to see him one day because of, I wanted to get his view on how we should move forward. I expected to walk into his Pentagon office and find four shiny stars on each shoulder. But I was greeted by Tom with his well-worn blue cardigan and his normal pleasant attitude and welcoming smile. It is a picture that I will never forget. May God bless Tom Mormon and God bless the Mormon family. Thank you. After retiring from the Air Force in 1997 as Vice Chief of Staff, General Mormon continued to serve in industry and a multitude of advisory roles where he led or participated in innumerable studies, including space organization, notably the Rumsfeld Commission, space industrial base, launch programs, space policy. He commanded respect and worked harder than anyone. He was always the person everyone sought out and listened to. He also taught and mentored multiple generations of space officers and industry leaders. He influenced senior Air Force, DOD, executive and legislative branch leaders. He often used to joke that 70% of the Earth's surface was covered by water, the other 30% was covered by space studies. And he likely holds the lifetime record for the most space studies led or participated in. But these studies brought together diverse groups of people across the space community to address these complex problems. Those who served on these studies were challenged to think critically and broadly, and each returned to their organization wiser and more understanding and stronger proponents for the importance of space in our nation's defense and security. On a personal note, I and my family have been most blessed by not only my professional relationship with General Mormon, but also our long friendship with he and Barbara. He was always there to offer counsel and support throughout much of my career, and they also were there as our family worked through medical challenges. We are deeply grateful and indebted. Finally, as historians examine the events and the people that shaped our post-World War II military, it is almost certain General Benny Schriever will be recognized as the father of military space. I am confident history will remember General Tom Mormon as the person who raised military space from infancy and adolescence to adulthood. 
We are all most fortunate to have known and worked for and with him on that noble journey. I go back uh, quite a ways with uh, Tom Mormon. Uh, we were both at Air Command and Staff College together as young officers in the Air Force uh, back in 1974. Uh, it was obvious to me then uh, that Tom was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, he was obviously somebody that people were already looking to on the space side. Uh, for me, I was a lonely fighter pilot, one of many. Uh, I went up the air side of the Air Force. He went up the uh, space side, obviously. Uh, we didn't have a lot of contact in our intermediate years, but uh, toward the end of our career, when Tom was the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, um, I, I was out at uh, Peterson Air Force Base as the NORAD uh, U.S. Space and Air Force Base Commander. I was put into a job uh, that happens to many of us as we get late in our careers that we may not have had a lot of experience in, uh, but uh, we knew people to talk to and uh, keep things on the straight and narrow. Tom, as the vice chief, was one I turned to many times as I was wrestling with space issues to get his counsel, his advice. He was always there for me. Uh, it made a huge difference. So that to be, put it very bluntly, I didn't screw things up as an air guy going in and commanding the space forces of our, of our Air Force. Um, once we retired, we still had a lot of contact. Probably, uh, not probably, we definitely had more than we did during our Air Force years. And that's because both of us served on what was known as the Space Commission, uh, chaired by Don Rumsfeld. Uh, Tom was the dominant voice. There were 13 of us commissioners. Uh, Tom was a very dominant voice in there because he knew what he was talking about. The rest of us were just operating in gut feel. I had a little experience. Uh, Chuck Horner had a little experience, but the, the rest of us uh, folks were uh, touched space briefly. Uh, obviously, were thought as important people to put on the commission. But again, Tom, because of his lifelong uh, experience in the Air Force uh, on the space side, knew what he was talking about. And we were talking about trying to look at the organization management of a national security space, not just the Air Force part of it. It turned out that report uh, had about 10 major recommendations, uh, which Tom's voice was clearly evident in all of them. Um, it turned out to be, I think, a very uh, center point for the direction that national security space went over the next two decades. We talked about a space corps. We talked about a space force um, and made some recommendations. Uh, we all could see that coming, but it wasn't the time back in the, two, the year 2000 uh, to put that in place. Um, and uh, we've seen over the last two decades what's happened. Of course, now we do have a space force. Uh, Tom and I also were on the, uh, as trustees on the uh, board of trustees at the Aerospace Corporation. We served there together for over 10 years. Um, that was an interesting thing because we would always look forward to going to board meetings for obvious reasons. And that was to be sure that aerospace was doing its thing when it comes to making sure that national security space was doing a proper acquisition and production of space systems so that they actually worked once they got on orbit, which is kind of important. But Tom and I, aside from being trustees, would always get together face-to-face -to -face at those meetings and talk about, in general, things that occurred or were occurring in the space world, national, and primarily the national security space world. We talked about commercial a little bit too, but I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed those conversations. I always learned, as I always had from Tom, uh, he always had a perspective which was interesting and well thought out. He was obviously involved in many things beyond just being a trustee at the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, he dealt on uh, many different uh, commissions and boards and things of that kind uh, that looked at things in the national security space world because he was so highly thought of uh, in the community. The conversations that I, Tom and I had uh, at Aerospace continued uh, right up to almost the end uh, of our relationship when Tom unfortunately passed away. I always found him an interesting guy to talk to. He always had something to say. Uh, I can tell you that in our later years, as the Space Force was starting to take shape, uh, he and I would talk about things and, and uh, he would have some good ideas. He was being asked a lot by people in Congress and others about his thoughts. I had occasion to be involved uh, slightly as well, 
but um, uh, I, I just uh, I know that Tom, uh, in his heart, uh, uh, in the, in his later years, really felt good about what was happening uh, at, with the space world. It was finally getting its due. It was finally going to be a separate service. Um, at, rightly so, under the Department of the Air Force, at least in my opinion, and Tom Stu at the time. Uh, but uh, it just uh, it all came together uh, in the last couple of years, and Tom got to see that uh, before he unfortunately passed away. I think uh, I, I just want to say uh, one thing to Tom's wife, Barbara. Barbara, I want to thank you uh, for all you did to make Tom the great success that he was. You were an uh, instrumental, you were his lifelong partner. Um, you had great influence on him, and I especially want to thank you for all you did in his last few years and making him as comfortable as you did to take care of his every need. Uh, I know you miss him. Uh, I miss him too. Uh, he was my friend. Thank you very much. The United States' success as a spacefaring nation rests soundly on the broad shoulders of General Tom Warner. His leadership, technical acuity, and enveloping personality filled every room with a problem-solving brilliance and always a smile. He was a man with a mission, and the mission was his mission. Tom was a student of the bureaucracy and used his very special skills to organize to effectively drive teams together. His leadership at Space Command defined the organization and its operation. His impressive space systems and launch accomplishments are indeed impressive. Tom was a great friend, partner, and contributor to the National Reconnaissance Office. He and I regularly collaborated and conspired to ensure that the better path forward was achievable. In particular, I was always in awe when General Mormon was the presiding officer for a retirement ceremony. At each ceremony, without notes, Tom summarized in detail, retirees, accolades, and successes. Tom recognized that it takes a village. Throughout his most distinguished life, Tom clearly demonstrated his love of both mission and humanity. I had the privilege of knowing Tom Mormon for over 30 years, and it's a great honor to be able to pay tribute to this great man. First and foremost, Tom was a U.S. Air Force officer. He and his wonderful wife, Barbara, had this cute little bulldog, and they would place a treat on the floor and say, Navy food. Dog wouldn't touch it. They then would place another treat on the floor and say, Air Force food, and the dog gobbled it right up. Tom came from a military family, and he was the epitome of honesty, integrity, and professionalism. He was honorable in every way. He was also the premier space leader of his time, and he mentored a generation of officers in the space field, many of whom are serving to this day. Tom had also the experience on both sides of the space divide between Air Force and NRO. I've often said that the NRO and the Air Force are like the taxidermist and veterinarian who go into business together and come up with the motto, either way you get your dog back. Well, Tom was able to bridge this divide. He was trusted by both the intelligence community and the military. And as a result, he was turned to for advice many times throughout his career and even after, and always to good effect. The nation has lost a great space leader, a great military officer, and many of us have lost a great friend. I am privileged to have known Tom Mormon. May he rest in peace. My name is Chris Williams. I first met General Mormon in the mid 1980s when I served as a strategic defense and space policy analyst in the office of the Secretary of Defense. I subsequently had the pleasure of engaging with General Mormon when I served as a professional staff member on the House Armed Services Committee and subsequently on the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. On many occasions, I had the opportunity to talk with General Mormon about various national security space programs and activities. He was always very gracious with his time and helped me to understand the importance of space programs and the challenges associated with acquiring and operating such sophisticated and vital systems. 
Honesty and sincerity are, of course, hallmarks of his illustrious career. Like so many others, I had the great fortune of seeing this firsthand over many years. But so was his infectious smile and laugh and his love of life. It was always a pleasure to engage in discussions with General Mormon on a broad range of topics. I learned a lot from General Mormon. He treated me with respect and viewed me as an ally in a great cause, namely assuring America's lead position in space for the betterment of our nation and for all mankind. Thus, I am thrilled that the National Security Space Association Studies and Analysis Center has recently been renamed the Mormon Center for Space Studies. I will do all in my power to ensure that the center lives up to his high standards of professionalism. What a great honor it is to lead the new Mormon Center. To the Mormon family, thank you very much. And thank you, General Mormon, for your significant and lasting contributions to the security of our great nation. Tall Mormon was a great American. Some might say this is an overused expression. For tall Mormon, it fits like a glove. I'm going to focus my remarks upon Tom and my involvement in various space-related independent reviews. These reviews involved issues including Titan IV failures, cost, schedule, and technical problems with critical national security space programs, and the development of next-generation civil weather satellites. Each review would take several months of intense activity. It was during these reviews that I gained a deep appreciation of Tom's intellect, his space experience, his wisdom, his common sense, and his uncanny ability to work with others, particularly those with different ideas and views. Tom was able to integrate these personal attributes into a conviction that for space, you had to do it right. This is what the space community calls mission success. Tom's ultimate goal was always mission success. In the conduct of these reviews, it seemed that there was always a point where Tom and I entered a spontaneous, in-depth and extensive debate. Some might say an argument. The results of these debates were always the same. I learned a lot. The issues became clear. The path to credible recommendations became obvious. And I often changed my views. These debates were typically a turning point in the review, resulting in recommendations that made an enormous contribution. This was but one example of the many ways Tom had an incredible positive impact on the United States space enterprise. I am thankful for the wonderful memories I have of working with and learning from Tom. Equally important to me is, I am proud that Tom was my friend. Hello, my name is Richard McKinney, and I'm honored to say a few words about General Tom Mormon. One of the most important and long-lasting roles of General Mormon's distinguished career was the role he played in fixing our national launch system. For years, the Air Force had looked at having more efficient and effective launch systems. We looked at advanced launch system and national launch system and the space lifter program. None of them worked. And we spent over $650 million trying to figure out a way to have a better launch system. And finally, Congress had had enough. They said to the Department of Defense, fix it. And the Department of Defense turned to General Tom Mormon to fix it. So we formed a study. And he had a great team, some of the team members you have heard from here today. And they looked at all manners of launch systems, but General Mormon knew that if the plan was to be implemented and funded by Congress, he had to get buy-in from NASA. So he went over to talk to the administrator of NASA. Now, he didn't go over with recommendations. He went over with options, because if he had recommendations, that many favored one approach or another, and that violated his rule of conservation of enemies. And one of the options he discussed with NASA was a reusable launch system. And NASA loved it. And in the end, the program ended up recommending, or having options rather, of an, a, an expendable launch system and a reusable launch system. And that's exactly what happened, just as General Mormon predicted. Congress funded it. 
and the Air Force program turned into the Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Program. I was fortunate enough to be the first program director of the EELV program. I had a great team and together we were honored to implement his plan. Now it has a formal name, but we just called it the Mormon study. And today, over two decades later, with a 100% launch success rate, we are still launching our most important national security space payloads on EELV. Thank you, General Mormon. Now on a personal note, during the last years of his life, we evolved into talking several times a month and we would talk for hours. We talk about space, we talk about baseball, we talk about all manners of things. But mostly, to be honest, I didn't do much talking, I listened. I listened to his stories, I learned about his wisdom, and I learned from his knowledge. And Barbara used to kid us about how long we talked. And she says, you guys are talking longer than I talk on the phone. <laughs> but it was, it, it's my most cherished memory of General Mormon. So thank you, Barbara, for letting me talk with General Mormon a few times a month. So thank you for letting me say a few words about someone I consider to be a national hero, General Thomas S. Mormon, Jr. Hello, I'm John Williams. I had the pleasure to work for Tom Mormon for the major part of 20 years. I'd like to speak to the Tom Mormon I knew through a few vignettes from that long time period. In December 1997, General Mormon's father dies and the funeral is to be at the Air Force Academy. It's the Christmas holidays. We're all on leave. General Ryan decides we will attend the funeral and pay our respects to the Mormon family, which we did. In later years, Tom repeated to me uh, at different times his great appreciation to General Ryan for that gesture. Tom never forgot. Fast forward a couple more years. In late 2000, upon my retirement from the Air Force, General Mormon told me I wasn't going to work for anybody else but him again. And he brought me to Booz Allen to join him and Eric Anderson. Our journey there was never boring or irrelevant as we executed a number of groundbreaking space policy and industrial based studies. But the day I remembered most was when Tom did something out of the ordinary. He came to my office, closed the door and sat down. He proceeded to tell me he'd been diagnosed with cancer. This was the beginning of the battle he fought until the end of his life. My wife, Cheryl, and I thank Barbara and the National Security Space Association for allowing us to contribute to today's event and honor my mentor and friend, Tom Mormon. I served as aide de camp to General Mormon when he was the commander of Air Force Space Command. And I got to know General Mormon as a gentleman's gentleman. Um, he was sophisticated, well-read, remarkably energetic and thoughtful for where he should lead his command. I remember um, vividly when Space Command took, um, took authorization of the launch mission meeting in Andrews Air Force Base. And it was a, it was a heady moment. Uh, General Hard and others around, around the table discussing how the implementation of that would occur. And I felt like I was in the presence of significant thinking and decision makers for the history of the Air Force and come to be history of the Space Force now. I remember he was, uh, he was also a very fun person to be with. When we were at Shimmy Air Force Base, Air Force Station, I remember him playing crud with the troops and, and even doing a bat hang, which was ridiculous given that he had suffered a hernia at the same time or previously. I remember him telling me about the stand-up of Space Command and creating the per perfect pitch and presenting that uh, in support of Jenning Hardinger. And from the creation of Space Command in its earliest days and shepherding it from his seat as Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Tom Mormon committed his life as an airman to the development of the force and to the betterment of the airmen that served within it. I had the wonderful opportunity to get to know Barbara and their boys and go skiing with them in Colorado. 
and travel with them to family in South Carolina and see them when they were, you know, off off duty, if you will. And the gentleman was the gentleman through and through on or off duty. He was a fun man to work with, an honorable man to work with, and I'll always look up to him and aspire to be like Tom Mormon. One of the things he liked to do uh, as he led various studies, and he led many of them in his career, was to charter uh, a t-shirt that would capture the essence of that study and the effort underway. So that's what we did with this study toward the end of the three month period when we were in Washington DC, we got an artist and we put this t-shirt together. He's a basketball fan, Joe Mormon was. And so it was a basketball themed t-shirt modeled after the commercials that were going on at the time. They were called the nothing but net commercials with Larry Bird and Michael Jordan. And the, the commercial showed the two basketball players playing the game of horse for the hamburger. And they had successively more difficult shots to make to include uh, impossible shots, such as shooting from a skyscraper across an expressway off a billboard through a window off the floor and making the basket nothing but net. So the task of this launch study was similarly impossible. So it was a great, it was a great uh, analogy. And so John Mormon was on the t-shirt in his basketball outfit with his, uh, uh, as with the ball as the captain and uh, the various launch constituency caricatures were on the front as well. It's national security launch, commercial launch and so forth. And uh, the ball was going through, through the net, nothing but net and it said, uh, the, the language on it was similar to the commercials. It said something like up to Widnall, over to OSD, across the river to the hill, nothing but net. And the scoreboard on the t-shirt said launch studies 103 new starts, meaning programmatic new starts for launch capabilities, zero. And so Joe Mormon loved that, that t-shirt and he handed it out to the leadership as he briefed out the launch study. He was a space visionary that laid the foundation for the space professional path that we both embarked upon as junior officers. It's this foundation that we are excited to see move into the future. In this new ever-changing world, we now have a space force. We have a vibrant commercial sector that's becoming more and more integrated with our national security space architecture and policy. And this future needs visionary leadership across the community. From the key US government seats that General Mormon and a slew of his protégés held, to the, to the new industrial partners, both big and small. We hope to have that same push for change and solidify space as a critical piece of our larger national security posture. We're here to try to improve and protect our country and our way of life by building on that legacy that General Borman created. Hello, I'm General Jay Raymond, the Chief of Space Operations for the United States Space Force. It's an absolute honor to celebrate the life and incredible contributions of General Tom Mormon. To put it simply, General Mormon was a hero, and I could talk all day about the impact he had on our nation, on national security space, on joint and coalition forces, and on me personally. But constrained by time, I'll focus on talking about General Mormon, the visionary, the master of space, and the man. I remember talking to General Mormon back in 2016, shortly after I took command of Air Force Base Command. And I relayed to him that when I was a student at Clemson University back in the early 80s, that General Hardinger, the first commander of Air Force Base Command came to speak to our detachment shortly after the command was established. What I didn't realize at that time was that General Mormon had written that speech. And thanks to the incredible historians at Air Force Base Command, I was able to get my hands on that speech. And I was absolutely amazed at just how visionary General Mormon was. 35 years before I assumed command at Air Force Base Command, he had clearly and in detail articulated the strategic environment that the United States Space Force faces today. This year marks the 30th anniversary of Desert Storm, and no discussion about that war is complete without talking about space or without talking about General Tom Mormon. It was General Mormon, the master of space, that unified missions from across the Air Force into a command singularly focused on space. That command was Air Force Space Command. It was also the master of space, General Mormon, who took the command he helped build to war when it was just nine years old. And under General Mormon's leadership, 
Air Force Space Command integrated space capabilities into theater operations, providing significant advantage to our nation, leading many to suggest it was the first space war. And for good reason. Space enabled that famous left hook across a featureless desert terrain at night. Space also detected theater-class Scud missiles using strategic missile warning capabilities. And space enabled the emergence of precision weapons. With the master of space at the helm, space professionals were no longer seen as just advocates of space power, but they were viewed as practitioners. Space was critical to the joint fight then, and in the 30 years since Desert Storm, space has become even more critical to everything that we do as a nation and as a joint and coalition force. What was new then now underpins our way of war. In General Mormon's own words, today space owns the battlefield. Finally, let me close with one final thought. Tom Mormon was a visionary and he was a master of space, but more importantly, he mastered being a good person and a great man. General Mormon was an inspiration, a teacher, a natural leader, and a friend. Simply, he was the best. General Mormon provides an enduring example of the mastery and visionary leadership that will be necessary to ensure the Space Force maintains its competitive edge well into the future. This was his purpose, and America's guardians will continue his tradition. To Mr. Robert Mormon, Beth Mormon, and Zachary Mormon, your brother, your brother-in-law, and your uncle mean the world to me and to the entire Space Force family, to the United States Air Force and our nation. And to Barbara Mormon, please know that we love you and we sure loved your husband. Your Space Force family will always be here for you. Semper Super. Hi, I'm Steve Carell. I am head of the fake Space Force, and I'm here today to honor the man who paved the way for the real Space Force, General Thomas Mormon Jr. General Mormon and I actually had a lot in common. He was a four-star general, and I once came in third for a People's Choice Award in 2008. He is considered to be one of the most influential figures in the history of the Air Force, and I once did an Illinois lottery commercial. He also had a long and distinguished career in the military, and I worked for three months as a mailman. I extend my most heartfelt condolences to General Mormon's family, and I thank him for his service. Heaven just became a better place. But I bet Tom is up there looking down on space constellations and hypothesizing some way to make America's systems even better. Godspeed, Tom Mormon.